Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. I hope you're all doing great. So today's case that I'm going to be telling you about is the Ted Bundy case. Yes, this is one of the big cases that is out there that have been out there for some time. And I've been really, really excited to share this as well on my channel. So let's dive in. Okay, Ted Bundy. Theodore Robert Cowell, known as Ted Bundy, was born on November the 24th, 1946. He was an American serial killer who had kidnapped, raped and murdered numerous young women and girls during the 1970s and possibly earlier. After more than decades of denials, the confessed to 30 murders that was committed in seven states between 1974 and 1978. His true victim total is unknown and is likely significantly higher. Bundy was often regarded as very charismatic and very handsome. His traits that he exploited was to win the trust of both his victims and society as a whole. He would typically approach his victims in public places, either feigning a physical impairment such as injury or impersonating a authority figure before bludgeoning them into unconsciousness and taking them to secondary locations to be raped and strangled. Bundy often revisited his victims grooming and performing sexual acts with corpses until decomposition Ugh. and destruction by wild animals made any further interactions impossible. At least 12 of his victims were decapitated and severed heads was kept as mementos at his apartment. What a psycho. On a few occasions, he broke into homes at night and bludgeoned his victims as they slept. In 1975, Bundy was arrested and jailed in Utah for aggravated kidnapping and attempted criminal assault. He then became a suspect in progressively longer list of unsolved homicides. He received three death sentences in two trials. Bundy was executed at Florida State Prison in Rayford on January 24th, 1989. Ted Bundy was born in Burlington in Vermont in the United States. He died on January 24th, 1989 at Florida State Prison in Rayford, Florida, US. He was executed by electrician, elec, electrocution, sorry. Um, yeah, electrocution. His name is Ted Bundy and he had gone by where Chris Hagen, Kenneth Meisner, Officer Roseland, Richard Burton, the campus killer, um, and Rolf Miller. His spouse was Carol Ann Boone and had one child. His convictions were first degree murder times three and attempted first degree murder times three again, aggravated kidnapping, burglary, and there were two death sentences in 1979, in 1980 also. One to 15 years in prison, 1976. He had actually escaped on June the 7th, 1977, June 13th, 1977, December 30th, 1977, and also February the 15th, 1978. There are 20 confirmed victims, 30 that he confessed to, 36 plus suspected. His span of crimes 1974-1978 in the United States, in California, in Colorado, Florida, Idaho, Oregon, Utah, Washington also and was apprehended on August the 16th, 1975. 
A biographer and rule characterized Ted as a sadistic sociopath who had took pleasure from another human's pain and the control that he had over his victims. To the point of death and after death, Bundy once described himself as the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you will ever meet. A statement with which the attorney, Paulie Nelson, a member then of his last defence team, agreed Ted that she wrote was very definition of a heartless evil. Ted Bundy's childhood. So Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell on November the 24th in 1946 to Eleanor Louise Cowell, born on 1924 and died then in 2012. She is known by her middle name, which is Louise, at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington in Vermont. His biological father's identity has never ever been confirmed. His original birth certificate apparently assigns a paternity to a salesman and a US Air Force veteran named Lloyd Marshall. Though there is a copy of it that is listed in his father's as unknown, Louise claimed that she met a war veteran named Jack Worthington, who abandoned her soon after she became pregnant. There is a census record that is revealing that several men by the name John Worthington and Lloyd Marshall lived near Louise when Bundy was conceived. Some family members expressed some suspicions that Bundy might have been fathered by Louise's own father, called Samuel Cowell. In the 2020 documentary film Crazy Not Insane, psychiatrist Dorothy Othwa Lewis claimed that she received a sample of Bundy's blood um, and that though she did not specify where it had come from, there was the arranged DNA test which confirmed that Bundy was not the product of incest. For the first three years of his life, Bundy lived in the Philadelphia home of his maternal grandparent, Samuel, who was born in 1898 to 1983. He had died. And Eleanor Cowell, born in 1895 and 1971, she died who had raised him as their son to avoid the social stigma of the wedlock at the time due to this accompanied birth that was outside of wedlock. Family, friends and even young Ted were told that his grandparents were his parents and that his mother was his older sister. And this was when Ted Bundy had ended up discovering the horrifying truth. Although Bundy's recollections of the circumstances had varied, he told a girlfriend that a cousin had showed him a copy of his own birth certificate after calling him a bastard. Quote. But he told biographers Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth that he found a certificate himself and the biographer and true crime writer Anne Rule, who knew Bundy personally, wrote that he did not find out until 1969 when he located his original birth record in Vermont. Bundy expressed a lifelong resentment towards his mother for never talking to him and this was about his real father and for leaving him to discover his true parentage for himself and that Bundy occasionally exhibited his disturbing behaviour at a very early age. Louise's younger sister Julia had recalled awakening from a nap to find herself surrounded by knives from the kitchen of a three-year-old Ted standing by her bed grimly smiling. Bundy's childhood neighbour Sandy Holt had described him as a bully, saying, quote, he liked to terrify people, he just liked to be in charge, and he liked to inflict pain and suffering and also the fears. In some interview, Bundy had spoke warmly of his grandparents and told Rule that he identified with respected and clung to his very um 
deceased grandfather at the time. Samuel had gone and threw Julia down a flight of stairs for oversleeping. He was sometimes spoke aloud to unseen presences and at least once flew into a violent rage when the question of Bundy's paternity had become raised. Bundy's described as his grandmother as a very timid and obedient woman who periodically underwent electrocuted convulsive therapy for depression and feared to leave their house toward the end of their life. These descriptions of Bundy's grandparents have been questioned in more recent investigations. Some locals remembered Sam Samuel Cowell as a fine man, if a bit very eccentric. A cousin of Bundy claimed that there was a negative characterization of Samuel Cowell, likely arose to explain why his grandson became a serial killer. In Addison, Louise's sister, Audrey stated that their mother couldn't leave her home because she suffered a stroke due to being very overweight and was not very mentally ill. In 1950, Louise changed her surname from Cowell to Nelson and at the urging of multiple family members left Philadelphia with Ted to live with cousins Alan and Jane Scott in Tacoma in Washington. In 1951, she met Johnny Culpepper Bundy in 1921 to 2007. A hospital cook at an adult singles night at Tacoma's First Methodist Church. They married later that year and Johnny formally adopted Ted. Johnny and Louise conceived four children together and though Johnny tried to include his adopted son in camping trips and other family activities, Ted remained very distant from him. He would later complain to a girlfriend that Johnny wasn't his real father. Quote, he wasn't very bright and didn't make much money. Bundy varied his recollections of Tacoma in later years, to Michaud and to Ainsworth. He is described roaming his neighbourhood, picking through trash barrels in search of pictures of naked women, and to Polly Nelson, he said, that he pursued in some detective magazines, crime novels and true crime documentaries for some stories that was involved in sexual violence, particularly when the stories were illustrations. And these illustrations was involved in dead women or maimed women. In a letter to Rule, however, he asserted that he never ever read fact detective magazines and shuddered at the thought that anyone actually would. He told me short that he would consume large quantities of alcohol and canvass the community late at night in search of undraped windows where he could observe all these women being undressed or whatever else could be seen. Accounts of Bundy's social life also varied, and he had told me Shord and Ainsworth that he had chose to be alone as an adolescent because he was unable to understand interpersonal relationships, that he had claimed that he had no natural sense of how to develop any friendships. Quote, I didn't know what made people, you know, want to be friends, Bundy said. Quote, I didn't know what underlying social interactions was. Classmates from Woodrow Wilson High School, however, told Rule that Bundy was, quote, well known and very well liked. There's a medium sized fish in a large pond. Bundy's only significant athletic advocation was downhill skiing and which he had gone and pursued some enthusiastically with stolen equipment and forged some lift tickets. During some high school, he was arrested at least two times. This was on suspicion of burglary and a motor vehicle theft. When he had reached age 18, the details of the incidents were 
expected from his record as it is customary in Washington and many other US states. After graduating from high school in 1965, Bundy had attended the University of Puget Sound, which is called the UPS, and also for one year before transferring to the University of Washington, which is, quote, the UW, to state some um, studies of Chinese. And in 1967, he became a romantically involved with a UW classmate, Diane Edwards, which had identified in Bundy's biographies by several pseudonyms, which is most commonly called Stephanie Brooks. In early 1968, Bundy dropped out of college and worked a series of minimum wage jobs. He was also volunteering at the Seattle office of Nest. Nelson Rockefeller's presidential campaign and became Arthur Fletcher's driver and bodyguard during Fletcher's campaign for the Lieutenant Governor of Washington State. In August, Bundy had attended the 1968 Republican National Convention in Miami as the Rockefeller defecate. Shortly thereafter, Edwards ended their relationship and returned to her family home and this was in California. Very frustrated about what she had described. Immaturity and also lack of ambition. Psychiatrist Dorothy Otnow Lewis would later then pinpoint this crisis as quote probably at the pivotal time in his development. Being devastated by the breakup of Bundy travelled to Colorado and then Far East visiting some relatives in Arkansas and Philadelphia and then enrolling for one semester at the Temple University. It was also at this time in early 1969, Rule believed that Bundy visited the office of the birth records in Burlington and also confirmed his true parentage. By the fall of um, 1969, when he met Elizabeth Klopfer, which is identified in Bundy's literature as Meg Anders or Beth Archer or Liz Kendall, a single mother from Ogden in Utah who worked as a secretary at the UW School of Medicine. This stormy relationship would continue well past his initial incarceration in Utah in 1976. Bundy became a father figure to Klopfer's daughter Molly, who was three years old when he had started dating her mother. He remained in her life until she was also after he had been arrested as an adult. Molly wrote off the incidents beginning at age seven in which Bundy was abusive or sexually inappropriate with her. Her accounts included Bundy as hitting her in the face, knocking her down, putting her at risk of drowning, indecent exposure, sexually touching and disguised as accidents or games. In the mid 1970s, Bundy now focused and goal orientated where he had re-enrolled at the UW. This is a time as a psychology major. He became a honor student and was well regarded by his professors in 1971. He had took a job at Seattle Suicide Hotline Crisis Center. There he had met and he had also worked with, alongside Anne Rule, a former Seattle police officer, an aspiring crime writer who would later write one of the definitive Bundy biographies, The Stranger Besides Me. Rule saw nothing disturbing in Bundy's personality at that time. She described him as kind, solicitatious and empathetic. After graduating from the UW in 1972, Bundy joined Governor Daniel J. Evans and re-election campaign, posing as a college student as he had shadowed Evans' opponent, former Governor Albert Rosalini, and he had recorded some of Stump's speeches for the analysis of Evans' team. 
Evans appointed Bundy to the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee. After Evans was re-elected, Bundy was hired as an assistant to Ross Davis. Chairman of the Washington State Republican Party Davis thought well of Bundy and described him as very smart, aggressive and a believer in the system. In early 1973, despite mediocre LSAT scores, Bundy was accepted into the law schools of UPS and the University of Utah on the strength of letters from the re recommended from Evans and Davis and several UW psychology professors. During a trip to California on Republican Party business in the summer of 1973, Bundy had then rekindled in his relationship with Edwards. She marveled then at his transformation into a serious and dedicated professional who was very seemingly on the cusp of a significant legal and political career. Bundy continued to date Klopfer as well neither woman was aware of the other's existence. In the fall of 1973, he had then matriculated at UPS Law School and continued courting Edwards, who flew to Seattle several times to stay with him. They discussed marriage and at one point introduced her to Davis as his fiance. In January 1974, Bundy had then abruptly broke off all contact with Edwards. Her phone calls and her letters went unreturned. When she finally reached him by phone a month later, she demanded to know why. He had just and laterally just ended their relationship without any explanation. In a flat, calm voice, he replied, Diane, I have no idea what you mean. And he just hung up. She never heard from him again. Bundy later explained, quote, I just wanted to prove to myself that I could have married her, quote. But Edwards concluded to retrospect that he had deliberately planned the entire courtship and the rejection in advance as some form of vengeance for this breakup. She initiated it in 1968. By then, Bundy had begun skipping classes at the law school. By April, he had stopped attending entirely as the young women began to disappear in the Pacific Northwest. There is no consensus as to when or where Bundy began killing all these women. He told different stories to different people and he refused to divulge in specifics of his earliest crime. Even as he confessed in graphic detail to dozen of later murders in the days preceding his execution, he told the psychologist Art Norman that he attempted his first kidnapping in 1969 in Ossidency in New Jersey. But he did not kill anyone until sometime in 1971 in Seattle. He told his psychologist Art Norman that he killed two women in Atlantic City while visiting a family in Philadelphia in 1969. Bundy hinted to homicide detective Robert D. Keppel that he committed a murder in Seattle in 1972 and another murder in 1973 that involved a hitchhiker near Tumwater, but he had refused to elaborate. Rule and Keppel both believed that he might have started killing as a teenager. Bundy's earliest documented homicides were committed in 1974, when he was age 27. By his own admission, he had by then mastered necessary skills in the era before DNA profiling to leave minimal incrimination forensic evidence at the crime scenes. Shortly after midnight on January the 4th, 1974, at the time he terminated the relationship with Edwards, Bundy entered his ba the basement of an apartment of the 18-year-old Karen Sparks, often identified as Joni Lenz or Mary Ad Adams or Terry Caldwell. In Bundy's literature, 
a dancer and a student at the UW. After bludgeoning Sparks with a metal rod from her bed frame, he sexually assaulted her with the same rod. Or as some call it, a metal speculum, causing extensive internal injuries. She remained unconscious in the hospital for 10 days. Although she survived, she was left with physical disabilities. In the early morning hours of February the 1st, Bundy broke into the basement room of Linda Ann Healy, a UW undergraduate who broadcast morning radio weather report for the skiers. He beat her unconscious, dressed her in blue jeans, white blouse, boots and carried her away. During the first half of 1974, the female college students disappeared at the rate about one per month by this time. On March the 12th, Donna Gail Manson, 19-year-old student at the Evergreen State College in Olympia, 60 miles southwest of Seattle, left her dormitory to attend a jazz concert on the campus, but she had never arrived. On April the 17th, Susan Elay Rancourt disappeared while on her way to the dorm room after an evening of advisors me meeting at a central Washington State College in Ellensburg, 110 miles southwest of Seattle. Two female central Washington students later came forward to report encounters, one on the night of Rancourt's disappearance. The other three nights earlier, with a man wearing a sling, who was asking for help carrying a load of books to his brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. On May the 6th, Roberta Kathleen Parks left a dormitory at Oregon State University in Corvallis, 260 miles of the south of Seattle, to have a coffee with friends at a memorial union, but she also never arrived. Investigators from Seattle and the King County grew increasingly concerned. There was no significant physical evidence of a missing woman that had little in common apart from similar appearances, young, attractive, white college students with long hair parted in the middle. June 1st, Brenda Carroll Ball, 22, disappeared after leaving the Flame Tavern in Burien near Seattle, Tacoma International Airport. She was last seen in the parking lot talking to a brown haired man with his arm in a sling. In the early hours of June the 11th, UW student Georgianne Hawkins vanished while walking down a brightly lit alleyway between her boyfriend's dormitory residence and her sorority house. The next morning, three Seattle homicide detectives and a criminologist combed the entire alleyway on their hands and knees, finding nothing. Bundy later told Keppel that he lived, he lured, sorry, Hawkins to his car and knocked her unconscious with a crowbar. After handcuffing her, he had drove her to Isaacar, a suburb 20 miles east of Seattle, where he strangled her and spent the entire night with her body. He later returned to the UW alley the morning after, in the midst of the major crime scene investigation, located and gathered Hawkins' earrings, and one of her shoes were left then. This was in the adjoining parking lot, and he had departed unobserved. Quote, it was so brazen that it astonishes the police even today. Bundy said that he had revisited Hawkins' corpse on three occasions. After Hawkins' disappearance was publicised, with some witnesses came forward to report seeing a man in an alley behind a nearby dormitory that had been linked to the disappearance. He was on crutches with a leg cast and was struggling to carry a briefcase. 
What woman recalled that man asked her to help him carry the case to his car? A light brown Volkswagen Beetle. During this period, Bundy was working in Olympia as an assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Commission, where he had wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. Later, he worked at the Department of Emergency Services, which is called the DES, a state government agency involved in the search for the missing women. At the DES, he then had begun dating Carol Ann Boone, and a two times divorced mother of two, who would then play a very important role in the final phase of Bundy's life. Six years later, reports of the brutal attack on Sparks and the six missing women appeared prominently in the newspapers and on television throughout the Washington and Oregon. Fear spread amongst the population, hitchhiking by young women dropping very sharply. Pressure mounted on law enforcement agencies, but the scarcity of the physical evidence severely hampered them. Police would not provide reporters with the little information that was available for fear of compromising the investigation further. Similarities between the victims were noted that the disappearance all took place at night, usually near ongoing construction work and were within a week of midterm of final exams. All of the victims were wearing slacks or blue jeans when they had disappeared and at many crime scenes there were sightings of a man wearing a cast or a sling and driving a brown or tan Volkswagen Beetle. The Oregon and Washington murders accumulated on July 14th with the broad daylight abductions of two women from the crowded bench at the Lake Samish state park in Isaaca. Five female witnesses described an attractive young man wearing a white tennis outfit with his left arm in a sling. Speaking with a light accent, perhaps Canadian or British, introduced himself as Ted. He asked for their help to unload a sailboat from his tan or bronze coloured Volkswagen Beetle. Four had refused, but one accompanied him as far as his car and saw that there was no sailboat and she had fled. Three additional witnesses saw him approach Janice Ann at age 23, a probation caseworker at the King County Juvenile Court with the sailboat story, and watched her leave the beach in his company. And about four hours later, Denise Marie Nasland, a 19-year-old woman who was studying to become a computer programmer, left a picnic to go to the restroom and she had never returned. Bundy told Stephen Michaud and William Hagmeyer that Ott was still alive when he had returned with Nasland and that he forced one to watch as he murdered the other but then he later denied it in the interview with Lewis on the eve of his execution. Kings County Police finally armed with the detailed description of the suspect and his car, posted flyers throughout the Seattle area. A composite sketch was printed in a regional newspaper and broadcasted on the local television stations. Cloper Rule and a DES employee and a UW psychology professor all recognised the profile, the sketch, the car, the reported Bundy then as a suspect. Detectives who were receiving up to 200 tips a day thought it was unlikely that a clean-cut law student with no adult criminal record could be the perpetrator. On September the 6th, two Grouse hunters stumbled then across a skeleton remain of Ott and Nasland near a service road which is in Isaacar. Two miles east of Lake Samish State Park, a extra femur 
and several vertebrates found at the site were later identified by Bundy as those of Hawkins. Six months later, the forestry students from Green River Community College discovered the skulls and some mandibles of Healy, Rancourt, Parks, Ball, on Taylor Mountain, where Bundy had frequented his hikes. He had just done East Isaacar. Manson's remains was never recovered. In August 1974, Bundy received a second acceptance from the University of Utah, which was a law school, and also moved to the Salt Lake City, leaving Klopfer then in Seattle. While he called Klopfer very often, he dated at least a dozen other women. As he studied then the first year of law curriculum, a second time, he was devastated to find out that the other students had something, some intellectual capacity that he did not have. He found the classes completely incomprehensible. It was a great disappointment to me, Bundy said. A new string of homicides began then the following months, including two that will remain undiscovered until Bundy confessed to them shortly before he was executed on September the 2nd. He then raped and strangled and still unidentified hitchhiker in Idaho, when either then would dispose the remains immediately in a nearby river or returned the next day to photograph and dismember the corpse. On October the 2nd, he had abducted 16-year-old Nancy Wilcox in Holiday, Utah, a suburb of the Salt Lake City. Bundy informed his investigators that her remains were buried near Capitol Reef, which is a national park, some 200 miles south of Holiday, and also they were never to be found again. October the 18th, Melissa Ann Smith, the 17-year-old daughter of the police chief of Midvale, another Salt Lake City suburb, had disappeared after leaving a pizza parlor. Her nude body was found in a nearby mountain, which was in the area for nine days, which was later post-mortem examination indicated that she may have remained alive for up to seven days following her disappearance. On October the 31st, Laura Ann Aim, age 17, disappeared on 25 miles south of there in Lehigh, which is after leaving leaving a lake that was just after midnight. Her naked body was found by hitchhikers nine miles to the northeast in the American Fork Canyon on the Thanksgiving day. Both girls had been beaten, raped, sodomized and strangled with nylon stockings. Years later, Bundy had described his post-mortem ritual with the corpses of Smith and Aim including hair shampooing and application of makeup. In the late afternoon of November the 8th, Bundy approached 18-year-old telephone operator Carol DeRanche at the Fashion Place Mail in Murray. Less than a mile from the Midvale restaurant where Smith was last seen, he identified himself as an officer, Roseland of Murray Police Department, and told Daronch that someone had attempted to break into her car. He asked her to accompany him to the station to file a complaint when Ronch then had pointed out that Bundy, he was driving on a road that did not lead to the police station. He immediately pulled onto the shoulder and then attempted to handcuff her. During this struggle, he inadvertently fastened both handcuffs to the same wrist and a Ronch then was able to open the car door to escape. Later that evening, Deborah Jean Kent, a 17-year-old student at Beaumont High School in Bountiful, 20 miles north of Murray, disappeared after leaving a theatre production at the school to pick up her brother. School's drama teacher then and a student told police that a stranger had then asked each of them to come out to the parking lot to 
identify a car. Another student later saw that same man pacing in the rear auditorium and the drama teacher spotted him again shortly before the end of play. Outside the auditorium, investigators found a key that unlocked the handcuffs, removed from Daronch's wrist. In November, Cloakford called King County Police a second time after reading that a young woman was disappearing in towns surrounding the Salt Lake City. Detective Randy Hershima of the Major Crimes Division interviewed her in much detail. By then, Bundy had risen considerably in the Kin County hierarchy of suspicion, but the Lake Shamish then witness considered most reliable, but detectives failed to identify him from a photo lineup. In December, Cloakford called the Salt Lake County Sheriff's Office and repeated her suspicions. Bundy's name was added to their list of suspects, but at the time, no credible forensic evidence linked him to the Utah crimes. In January 1975, Bundy returned to Seattle after his final exams and spent a week with Cloakford, who did not tell him that she reported him to the police on three occasions. She had made plans to visit him in Salt Lake City in August. In 1975, Bundy shifted much of his criminal activity eastward from his base in Utah to Colorado. On January the 12th, 23-year-old registered nurse named Karen Eileen Campbell disappeared while walking down a well-lit hallway between the elevator and their room at the Wildwood Inn. Now it's Wildwood Lodge, in Snowmass Village, 400 miles southeast of Salt Lake City. A nude body was found a month later next to a dirt road, just outside the resort. She had been killed by blows to her head from a blunt force trauma, with blunt instrument that left distinctive linear groove depressions on her skull. Her body also bore deep cuts from a sharp weapon. On March the 15th, 100 miles northeast of Snowmass, Vail ski instructor Julie Cunningham, age 26, disappeared while walking from her apartment to a dinner date with a friend. Bundy later told Colorado investigators that he approached Cunningham on crutches and asked her to help him carry some ski boots to his car, where he had clubbed and handcuffed her before sexually assaulting and strangling her at the secondary site. This was at the Nia Rifle, 90 miles west of Vail. Weeks later, he made the six-hour drive from Salt Lake City to revisit her remains. Denise Lynn Olivia, son 25, disappeared near the Utah-Colorado border in Grand Junction on April the 6th while riding her bicycle to her parents' house. And her bike sandals were also found under a viaduct that was near a railroad bridge. On May the 6th, Bundy lured 12-year-old Lynette Dawn Culver from Alameda Junior High School in Pong Pocatello in Idaho, 160 miles north Salt Lake City. He drowned her in his hotel room, after which he disposed of her body in a river, likely the Snake River, north of the Pocatello. In mid-May, three of Bundy's Washington State DES co-workers, included Boone, visited him in Salt Lake City and stayed for a week in his apartment. He subsequently spent a week in Seattle with Klopfa in early June and discussed getting married the following Christmas. Again, Klopfa made no mention of her multiple discussions with the authorities in the King County and Salt Lake County. Bundy disclosed neither his ongoing relationships with Boone nor a concurrent romance with a Utah law student known in various accounts as Kim Andrews or as Sharon Orr. On June 28th, Susan Kurtz, Curtis vanished from the campus of Brigham Young University in Provo, 45 miles south of Salt Lake City. Her murder became Bundy's last confession tape recorded moments before he entered the execution chamber.
The bodies of Wilcox, Kent, Cunningham, Oliver's son, Culver were never recovered. In August or September 1975, Bundy was baptised into a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Although he was not an active participant in services and ignored most church restrictions, he would later be excommunicated by the LDS Church following his 1976 kidnapping and conviction. When he asked his religious preference after his arrest, Bundy answered, a Methodist. The religion of his childhood. In Washington State, investigators were still struggling to analyse the Pacific Northwest murder spree that had ended abruptly as it had begun, in an effort to make sense of an overwhelming mass of data. They had resorted to then the innovative strategy of compiling a database they used to King County Payroll Computer, a quote, huge primitive machine by contemporary standards, but the only one available for their use after inputting many lists that they had compiled as the classmates and also the acquaintances of each victim. The Volkswagen owners named as Ted, known sex offenders and so on. They queried the computer for coincidences. Out of thousands of names, 26 turned up on four lists, one was Ted Bundy. Detectives also manually compiled a list of their 100 quote best suspects and Bundy was on that list as well. He was quote literally at the top of the pile of the suspects when the word came from Utah of his arrest. On August 16, 1975, Bundy was arrested by Utah Highway Patrol Officer Bob Hayward in Granger, another Salt Lake City suburb. Hayward observed Bundy's cruising a residential area in his Volkswagen Beetle during the pre-dawn hours and fleeing at high speed after seeing a patrol car. He noticed that the Volkswagen's front passenger seat had been removed and placed on the rear seats and searched the car. He found a ski mask, a second mask fashioned from a pantyhose, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, a coil of rope, ice pick and other items initially assumed to be a burglary tool. Bundy explained that the ski mask was for skiing and he had found the handcuffs in a dumpster. The rest was just some common household items. However, detectives Jerry Thompson remembered a similar suspect and a car description from the November 1974 Deranch kidnapping and Bundy's apartment the police found a guided then to Colorado ski resorts with a check mark by the Wildwood Inn and a brochure then that advertised the Vermont High School play in Bountiful, where Kent had disappeared. The police did not have sufficient evidence to detain Bundy, so he was released on his own recognition. Bundy later said that the searches was missed, a hidden collection of some Polaroid photographs of his victims, which he destroyed after he was released. Salt Lake City Police had placed Bundy on 24-hour surveillance and Thompson flew to Seattle with two other detectives and also interviewed Klopfer. She told them that in the year prior to Bundy's move to Utah, she had discovered objects that she couldn't understand in her house and also in Bundy's apartment. These items included crutches, bag of plaster of Paris that he admitted stealing from a medical supply house and a meat cleaver that was never used for cooking. Additional objects included surgical gloves, a oriental knife in a wooded case that he kept in his glove compartment and a sack full of women's clothing. Bundy was perpetually in debt and Klopfer suspected then that he had stolen almost everything of significant value that he had possessed. 
When she confronted Bundy over a new TV and a stereo, he warned her, quote, If you tell anyone, I'll break your fucking neck, quote, she said. Bundy became very upset whenever she considered cutting her hair, which was long and parted in the middle. She was sometimes awakened in the middle of the night to find him under the bed covers with a flashlight examining her body. He kept a lug wrench taped halfway up the handle in the trunk of his car, which was another Volkswagen Beetle, which he often borrowed for protection. Detectives then had confirmed that Bundy had not been with Klopfer on any of the nights during which the Pacific Northwest victims had vanished, nor on the day Ott and Nasland were abducted from the Lake Shamish in the State Park. Shortly thereafter, Klopfer was interviewed by Seattle homicide detective Kathy Machisney and also learned of the existence of Diane Edwards and a brief engagement to Bundy around Christmas in 1973. In September, Bundy sold his Volkswagen Beetle to a Midvale teenager. The Utah police impounded it and the FBI technicians dismantled and searched the car. They found hair matching samples obtained by Campbell's body. Later, they also identified hair strands microscopically indistinguishable from those of Smith and Daronch. FBI lab specialist Robert, Robert Neal concluded that the presence of hair strands in the car matching three different victims who had never met one another would be a coincidence of mind-boggling rarity. On October the 2nd, detectives put Bundy into a lineup. Daronch immediately identified him as the officer, Roseland, and witnesses then from Bountiful recognised him as the stranger at Vermont High School in the auditorium. There was insufficient evidence to link him with Kent, whose body never been found, but more than enough evidence to charge him as aggravated kidnapping. There was an attempted criminal assault in the Deranch case. Being freed on $15,000 bail paid by his parents and spent most time between indictment and a trial in Seattle, living in Klopfer's house. Seattle police had insufficient evidence to charge him in the Pacific Northwest murders, but kept him under close surveillance. Quote, when Ted and I stepped out onto the porch to go somewhere, so many unmarked police cars started up that it sounded like the beginning of a indie 500 said Klopfer. In November, the three principal Bundy investigators, Jerry Thompson from Utah, Robert Keppel from Washington, and Michael Fisher from Colorado met in Aspen and Colorado and exchanged information from 30 detectives and prosecutors from five states. While officials left the meeting later referred to as the Aspen Summit convinced that Bundy was the murderer that they sought. They agreed that more hard evidence could be needed before he could be charged with any of the murders. In February 1976, Bundy stood trial for the Durant kidnapping. On the advice of his attorney, John O'Connell, he waived his right to a jury due to a negative publicity surrounding the case. After a four-day bench trial and a weekend of deliberation, Judge Stewart Hansen Jr. found him guilty of kidnapping and a assault. In June, he was sentenced to 1 to 15 years in the Utah State Prison. In October, he was found hiding in a bushes in the prison yard carrying a quote escape kit, which is road maps, airline schedules and a social security card and spent several weeks in solitary confinement. Later that month, Colorado authorities charged him with Campbell's murder. After a period of resistance, he waived extradition proceedings and was transferred to Aspen in January 1977. On June 7, 1977, 
Bundy was transported 40 miles from the Garfield County Jail in Glenwood Springs to Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen for a preliminary hearing. He had elected to serve at his own attorney and as such executed, excused by judge from wearing handcuffs or any leg shackles. During a recess, he asked to visit the courthouse's law library to research his case. While she did from his guards, the view behind a bookcase was opened a window and jumped to the ground. From the second story, injuring his right ankle as he had landed. After shredding a outer layer of clothing, Bundy limped through Aspen as roadblocks were being set up and this was on the outskirts then that he had hiked then south onto Aspen Mountain near its summit that he had broke into a hunting cabin and stole food and also there was clothing and also a rifle. The following day he left the cabin and continued south towards the town of the Crested but but also became lost in the forest. For two days he had wandered aimlessly on the mountain, missing two trails that led downward to his intended destination. On June the 10th he broke into a camping trailer and this was on a maroon lake 10 miles south of Aspen taking food and ski parker. However, instead of continuing southward, he walked back north towards Aspen, eluding roadblocks and searching parties along the way. Three days later, he stole a car at the edge of Aspen Golf Course. Okay then everyone, so I'm doing two parts. So this is part one and I will be coming back for part two. I hope you're enjoying it so far. And until next video, I see you then. Bye.